The Carnegie Mellon Quarantine Database Talks are made possible by the Stephen Moy Foundation for Keeping It Real and by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Let's get started. It's still a pandemic. Uh, so let's talk about databases. So today we have Marianne and Cheng from Databricks to come talk about the Spark SQL uh, Catalyst Optimizer, which as far as I know is based on Cascades, correct? Or no? Uh, kind of. Kind of, okay, perfect. They'll explain what, what that means. Um, so uh, Cheng will be the first speaker. So he is an engineering manager at Databricks. Um, he is a member of the Apache Smart uh, committer, committer Group and a committer for Apache Parquet. Um, he has an eight-month-year-old daughter, uh, which may interrupt us during the talk, but that's okay. Uh, Marianne is a staff software engineer from Databricks. Uh, prior to joining Databricks, she worked with Intel, um, and she's also a committer member of Apache CalSite and Apache Phoenix. Okay, with that, uh, again, we'll, we'll get started. Again, if, if you have any questions for Chang and Marianne, please unmute yourself, interrupt, interrupt them, say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask your question. And again, we'd also like to thank the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real for sponsoring us today. All right, Chang, the floor is, floor is yours. Go for it. Thanks, Andy. Hey, everyone. Uh, it's uh, so nice to have the opportunity here to um, introduce uh, this Spark SQL Catalyst Optimizer. Uh, so uh, first of all, let me introduce um, ourselves. Uh, so um, I'm having uh, my colleague, Marion Shirley, um, here uh, together with me. Um, as uh, Andy already introduced, she's a, a staff engineer at Databricks. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm an engineering manager at Databricks. Uh, also an EMC member of the Apache Spark and committer of the Apache Spark K. Um, so uh, before jumping into a catalyst, let's talk a little bit about um, the unified anal analytics story in the Apache Spark. So um, unlike other database systems discussed in the, the Quarantine DB Tech Talk series, initially Apache Spark itself was not invented as a SQL database system. So instead, Apache Spark is the first unified analytics and data processing engine, and it provides a rich set of APIs and multiple language bindings to express different types of workloads within a single framework. So workloads are ranging from a traditional ETL to streaming, machine learning, and graph processing, et cetera, are all nicely covered. So this new paradigm brings us a lower operational cost and better performance, since now we only need to run a single framework and data exchange between different systems, it can be minimized. And at its core, there is a, the concept of resilient distribu distributed data sets, or RDB, which provides a primitive to express MR style parallel and distributed computation. And later in the second generation of the Spark API, we provided a relational stru structure layer and made it the new foundation of the rest of the ecosystem. So this structure layer is a Spark SQL, which is a set of a structured API that enable users to query data stored anywhere in any format at scale. So the secret behind this anywhere in any format part of uh, the data source API um, users can connect it to all kinds of uh, data sources by building plugins, implementing this Spark SQL data source API. And the data source do not necessarily need to be uh, other databases or data stores. For example, at Databricks, so we build data sources for Jira, for Jenkins, and PagerDuty by invoking the REST API so that we can join them together and analyze uh, Jenkins test of failures and fake tests, which is a pretty interesting use case. And so why we want APIs to be structured? Uh, why they are more preferred than the original RDD API? So here are three implementations of the same query using RDD, data frame, and SQL. And you can see that uh, we're just uh, trying to group by a department and uh, compute the average age of all the employees. <coughs> As you can see, the RDD API does not really understand the structure of the data being processed. The users have to describe the data structure and manipulate them explicitly in user-defined functions. This not only makes the implementation itself cumbersome and error-prone, but also makes it hard to optimize. Because uh, to the framework itself, uh, to Spark, the user-defined functions are simply opaque and black boxes. And on the other hand, the data frame and SQL implementations are much more concise 
because the structure of the data is discovered or specified in prior, and the framework can leverage this information to compile the decorative programs more efficiently. Can you say roughly what percentage of like Databricks customers uses which, you know, those three choices? Like, is, is it are you primarily executing SQL queries? Are you primarily RDD or data frames? Like, what's what's like ranking? What's the most common? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, to our observation, uh, SQL and Python API are the most popular. And uh, nowadays, um, um, if some customers are using the RDD API, they are mostly due to Alexi workloads. So. Uh, we can relatively safe to, uh, I, I think it's relatively safe to say that um, uh, almost no c new customers are writing new RDD uh, programs nowadays. What was, what was it you said? What kind of workloads? Uh, SQL and Python. No, but Python. You, but the, the, you said something else, like, it was saying like Alexa workloads? Is that what you said? Oh, legacy, Alexa Oh, workloads. legacy, legacy, Maybe, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Got it, okay. yeah, Maybe awesome. they developed some, some RDD uh, stuff um, years ago. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah. And also, uh, so as a summary, a uh, structure is a limit of what we can express. So they, are, they impose certain limitations, but in practice, the vast majority of the computations can still be accommodated. And limiting the space of uh, what can be expressed enables us to write uh, more declarative representations, and it also enables more optimizations. And to take advantage of the optimization opportunities, you basically need an optimizer that can automatically detect or those uh, most efficient plans and execute those operations specified in the user workloads on Spark. So that brings us to the main topic here, uh, which is the Catalyst, the Spark SQL query optimizer. So I will firstly bring you a 10,000 feed overview of this uh, uh, optimizer. And then we will focus on one specific aspect, uh, which is the adaptive core execution. Uh, and uh, Marianne will uh, bring you uh, that part. And we will also see why adaptive core execution is um, that important uh, in the context of the Apache Spark. So here is uh, what uh, Catalyst uh, uh, looks like and where it locates in the Apache Spark projects. Um, because Apache Spark provides a different APIs and different language bindings, you can see that at the left side, uh, you can express your workloads in different languages, in Java, Scala, R, Python, and in different APIs, and data frame API, or the type to data set API, or just to write a raw SQL. And no matter how you express your API, uh, they are uh, parsed or constructed into a quarter plan. And um, uh, once you have the quarter plan, then the catalyst is there to help you to optimize the quarter plan into a uh, physical quarter plan and then compiled into RDDs, which are the uh, native or the assembly language of Apache Spark. And Below this, uh, uh, below is the uh, um, zoomed in image of the Catalyst optimizer. So you can see that there are several very standard components uh, there uh, and faces there. So there's an analysis phase um, <coughs> that translates unresolved logical plans and tries to uh, pick up all those uh, unresolved names and try to resolve them using information from the catalog and translate them into uh, physical entities like tables or columns and that kind of stuff. Well, let's look at them uh, more deeply. So the, uh, the analysis phase uses the catalog to resolve names into physical entities, I just said. And uh, this one transforms unresolved logical plans to resolved logical plans. And by resolved, it means that all the unknown names are, are bound to uh, physical entities like databases, tables, columns, etc. And in the logical optimization phase, applying, uh, it applies a relational algebra to transform, uh, resolve the logical plans into equivalent but faster alternative versions. And cost-based join reordering also happens at this phase. And the third phase is the physical planning, where we translate op optimize the logical plans into executable physical plans. And although here, uh, Catalyst uh, 
theoretically supports generating multiple physical plans and then uh, further leverage a custom model to choose one. But we are actually uh, right now only generating one physical plan uh, in Apache Spark. And we can, uh, we can see a part of the reason why uh, in, the, in the later part of the, the stock. Let me make sure I understand. So the, the optimized logical plan, and then the, the physical planning part, you're saying that this is before you touch the cost model or you're using the cost model to, to then select what the best plan? Maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, like, th yeah, this image might not be the best way to illustrate it. Uh, actually, in the optimization phase, we already have a statistics uh, collected and uh, we are already uh, leveraging the cost model uh, to do certain um, operations like uh, joint reordering. Okay. And and even, yeah, and, and uh, physical planning uh, phase, we are also leveraging the cost model uh, to do things like uh, uh, joint selection. Okay. And then um, maybe I'm missing it. Then there was this. You said you produce one physical plan instead of, but you instead of multiple physical plans. I'm missing what that point was. Like, like. Yeah. So at API yeah. level, <coughs> at API level, uh, Catalyst uh, was designed to be able to produce uh, multiple physical plans, and then uh, typically, like other database systems, you may want to choose one of the plan that has the least cost. Uh, however, right now, um, Calus does not really implement this approach. Instead, we are just uh, generating one physical plan and always stick with that. So that, that means that you're not doing a. I mean, are you doing this? You're not doing a search then. Are you just you just have a bunch of rules that do the transformations? Right. The, the, the later. The latter. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're just correct. using a bunch of the so it's strategies. just uh, everything in right now in Spark Optimizer or whatever physical planner is just doing local Optima instead of global Optima. So there is no yeah. um, you know like consideration between different rules um, in terms of the cost. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, uh, now let's uh, zoom out a little bit. So uh, within Catalyst, uh, there are two things that are the key concept. The first one is the transformation, which uh, transforms uh, query plans to different type of query plans or the same type, but um, different shape of the query plan trees. And the second concept is the trees, which is used to do, uh, which is used as the abstraction of the user programs. No matter your programs are written in SQL, in data frame, uh, or in uh, whatever language binding you are using. And here uh, you can see that um, before we are turning the optimizing power plan into an RDD, there is a code generation phase. And by code generation, it means that um, a Spark, Apache Spark actually uh, tries to translate the, uh, a physical power plan into Java code. Um, which is a highly specialized, um, and then we run the Java code in RDD so that um, we can maximize the performance. So first of all, let's look at the trees, which is an abstraction of the user programs. So here is a very simple um, aggregation. Oh, sorry, uh, there, there are very simple aggregation of plus a join, uh, a, simple, a simple SQL query here. So, First of all, there are expressions. Expressions in uh, Apache Spark is uh, expressed as trees. So uh, an expression represents a new value computed based on input values. Uh, and an attribute is a column of a data set or a column generated by a specific data operation. And uh, uh, for example, uh, here a, values, uh, a value is a attribute from the relation T1 and um, the uh, value uh, v is a generated column uh, generated by the uh, select or the projection operator in this uh, query. And the second kind of uh, a tree is query plans. Um, you can see that the select, join, and where are translated correspondingly into aggregate, or project, or filter, and join operators, which is quite common. And for all these uh, query plan trees, so there are, we can further uh, set, we can further cater, uh, categorize them into a logical query plans, which describes computation on data sets without defining how to conduct the computation. 
And for a logical plans, uh, there are a few uh, fields. Uh, the first of them is the so-called output, which is a list of attributes generated by the uh, plan node. Uh, and basically, if you, if you see a plan node as a function, it basically is the, the return value of uh, this plan node. And the second one is uh, a set of constraints, which is in a set of invariants about the rows generated by your plan node. Uh, for example, um, t2.id is greater than 50,000. Uh, this one is a constraint about the, or the rows uh, spit from th this filter node. And the last one is statistics, uh, which is uh, uh, the size of the plan node in rows or bytes, and also per column statistics, if available like min, max values, uh, number of distinct values, nulls, et cetera. And the second kind of uh, a quarter plan tree is a physical plan. And the physical plan describes a computation on data sets with specific definition on how to conduct the computation, which means that the physical plans are executable. So you can see that instead of uh, just to say in aggregate or project or drawing, and here we're saying, hash aggregate or sort merge join, and the table is a parquet scan or a JSON scan. So you are trying to specify how to execute uh, these uh, relational operators. So the second concept uh, in the catalyst is transformations, which is the building blocks of the uh, optimizer rules and um, uh, corresponding rules. The transformation is to transform the shape and or the type of the tree. So there are building blocks of uh, these three kinds of uh, um, concepts. The first one is analysis and optimization rules. And so analysis rules are, and optimization rules, they both translate the logical plans to logical plans. And uh, uh, strategies, which translates the logical plans to physical plans. This is where uh, physical planning happens. And also physical plan pre uh, preparation rules, which we will elaborate on later. Uh, so these rules are physical plan to physical plan rules. So here is an example. Transformations are implemented using a scalar partial functions and pattern matching. So uh, here's a very a simple example of a constant folding. Uh, on the left, there is an expression of 1 plus 2 plus t1 the value, which is a parse as a tree like this. And here, because a 1 and 2 can be computed at, at compile time, so we transform, uh, we transform it into a 3 plus t1 value. So instead of evaluating 1 plus 2 for every single row, right now we just evaluate the one that uh, 1 plus 2 once during compilation, during quarter compilation, uh, so that um, it hopefully brings better performance. And to implement this one, it is actually quite concise in uh, a catalyst thanks to uh, the, uh, the functional features in the Scala language. So you can see that there is an expression variable, which is of type expression, and you can just uh, transform it and using a partial function, which is the, the body uh, encodes by the, this pair of the braces. And the red part uh, specifies a very concrete pattern. Uh, which says that um, uh, if you have an add operator uh, containing two literals of integers, uh, then you can basically return a single literal and, uh, containing the sum of uh, uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So th th this is like a built-in Scala thing to do this pattern matching. This is not something you had to build yourself, like a rule engine. To do no, no. Yeah, this is a building feature of the, the Scala language, which is um, uh, the, the reason why uh, the catalyst the optimizer is uh, very concise itself. Yeah, and using uh, these uh, building blocks, we can uh, implement different rules and also combining multiple rules. For example, here is an example of the predicate and push down. Uh, so the original SQL query plan, uh, the original SQL uh, statement that we just showed uh, is translated into this query plan. The uh, topmost aggregate is omitted because uh, it's not important here. And you can see that um, uh, this filter uh, can actually be pushed down to this uh, uh, a one side of this uh, join operator because um, a part of this filter only touches T2 uh, so that um, we can transform it into the right-hand side. Uh, and this way, we can reduce uh, the number of rows to spit from the right-hand side of this join operator. And the second example is column pruning. And you can see that for uh, on the left-hand side, um, the 
the the left hand side of this, this drawing only needed t1 dot id and uh, t1 dot value and for the right hand side we only need the t2 dot id so we add two extra projections there uh, so that um, we can uh, shrink the size of the um, rows split from uh, both sides and Naturally, you can compose both of these two rules so that you have the original plan and after applying these two rules, um, you get the right-hand side. And the, facility, the facilities we use uh, to combine uh, different uh, rules is um, uh, this rule executor concept. Um, a rule executor transforms a tree to another tree of the same type by repeatedly applying multiple rules defined in rule batches. So you can see that an optimizer itself can consist of uh, multiple batches and a single batch can, uh, containing uh, multiple rules. And a single batch can be executed in one of the two strategies, either a fixed point strategy, which means that it applies all the rules in this batch over and over again until the, uh, the shape of the, the kernel plan stops changing. Or it can be in the once strategy, which means that all the rules are just uh, applied once and then uh, we quit in this batch. So every single rule here is implemented based on transformations. So this is a basic idea the, uh, how those building blocks are organized or together. So do you, do you, is, does the programmer of these transformations have to specify like what can be combined together? Like I, 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 don't, I don't fully understand this. Like I understand that you, there are rules you want to combine together, but like how, who is deciding what could be combined? Maybe that's what I'm asking. Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, these are right now hard coded in Apache Spark. Uh, conceptually, we can make this one uh, configurable so that uh, advanced users can even choose what kind of um, uh, optimizer rules you want, or it can uh, make it more easier to uh, implement your own rules and plug into that. Uh, but Apache Spark actually provides this kind of extension points. And also, uh, if we want to go more or one step further, you can maybe also specify dependencies between different rules so that um, uh, it may do some further, uh, more sophisticated optimizations. But right. today, it is a basically hard coded inside the Spark. So, I mean, you mentioned that the, you know, you, either you do or you, or you want to expose an API to allow people to, to, to modify these dependencies, to modify these rules. But I mean, that's not something the average user could even be you know begin, even begin to doing like this is not something you expose to to you know your your run of databricks customer so i guess my question would be exactly are, are you are you aware of anybody making major modifications to the the, the query optimizer in, in yeah actually actually yes uh so people who are writing advanced data sources sometimes want to touch okay. these um, uh, internal uh, extension points. For example, a TiDB, uh, a TiDB yeah. database, yeah, from uh, from PinCap, and yeah. they actually have a component called Ti Spark, and uh, they basically uh, do not reuse their uh, TiDB database layer, but just to build a, uh, a Spark layer above their key value store, and uh, that TiDB extension actually uh, provides extra um, optimization rules and physical plans uh, in order to read things from a uh, type KV efficiently. That, that makes sense. I think Splice Machine is doing the same kind of thing. So I, 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 this is helpful. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask a question? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, this is Lin. Uh, I'm a PG student here. So uh, you mentioned there's these two kind of strategies, fixed point and mm -hmm. once. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. So I'm actually wondering, how do you uh, decide what would be fixed point or what would be, be once? Is there some sort of like a pattern uh, uh, or principles that you are following? Yeah, so uh, for example, if you are having certain rules that, um, uh, let, me, let me think, how do you explain this? Uh, Let's take a constant propagation as an example. Uh, for example, your, your query actually contains a multiple uh, places where constant folding can, can happen. Uh, you can implement this rule in a very sophisticated way that you just go through this rule once and uh, fold all the constants. And on the other hand, uh, you can also implement this rule in a very 
simple manner and uh, only uh, follow one pair of the constants at a time and apply this rule repeatedly so that um, uh, it can uh, it can always uh, find out all the opportunities and um, uh, fold all the constants uh, in the end. So uh, at this level, it is uh, for implementation. Uh, it is basically de uh, implementation details. If you choose the first manner, then you can you can use it once, and the optimizer itself is actually more efficient at runtime. And if you choose the second manner, you need to use a fixed point. And uh, uh, there are also certain rules uh, we apply at the end of the analyzer, uh, we call them uh, checkers. Like uh, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the the analysis phase actually uh, detected all the errors and all the unknown uh, entities are already translated. And for those kind of uh, rules, we only want to apply them once. And yeah, so these are some of the very, very uh, rough um, uh, principle. Yeah, Marion, do, do you have anything to add? Uh, well, basically, I think uh, for fixed point, um, usually it's um, like it's a batch of um, like a series of rules, and triggering one rule could actually change the plan in a way that yeah, provides right. more opportunity for the rule that is. I mean, for the rule that is preceding this rule in a batch to reapply again so like yeah. yeah at certain point right i mean like even if you write a rule constant propagation for example even if you've written it in a way that it it doesn't have to be triggered more than once um but later on some other rule may change the plan in a way that there's more constant propagation or constant folding uh opportunities so like a batch of rules they're kind of you know they're related um right. and then um and then in my opinion uh we don't like ne we don't necessarily need this once policy um it's just a shortcut for a fixed point uh overall every rule should be um like should be written uh in an item potent way that even if it's fixed point it should um you know come to a stable status just after being applied once yeah yeah thanks yeah. a lot for the explanation that's very helpful yeah, thanks yeah uh hi yeah, this here point. i have a quick question sure uh is there any way for you guys to test if a new like you told that all the rules are hard coded by developers so is there a way to test if the rule actually broke some previous rules like some regression framework or something do you guys do that or is that mostly like manual uh to code reviews and stuff. Yeah, inside inside data breaks, we actually uh, have um, uh, different uh, testing harness like uh, random query generator and uh, longevity test, uh, those kind of things to help us uh, catch in these these kind of uh, issues. Uh, but if you are, a, for example, if you are an author of an uh, advanced data source and you want to um, insert your own optimizer rule, then basically you are on your own. Okay. Yeah, and also. Uh, for a fixed point, um, sometimes a rule is buggy in a way that um, uh, the query plan does not really converge. Sometimes it, it might be uh, it, it might be a growing uh, the query plan indefinitely. Uh, sometimes it might be a jumping between two uh, shape of the uh, plans repeatedly. And we actually apply one maximum iteration limitation there. So that, uh, for example, the, deep, uh, the default value, I believe, right now is 100. Uh, if a rule is uh, applied 100 times, uh, if a batch, uh, if a rule batch is uh, repeatedly uh, applied 100 times, uh, still haven't reached the, the fixed point, we also end it. And at this uh, stage, we will also issue an, uh, a warning walk or something like that, and basically uh, indicating that uh, something is wrong. I see. That's interesting to know. Yeah. Thanks. Interesting to know. You mentioned, uh, you said you, you run longevity tests. What, is, what, what kind of test is that? What do you mean by that? Oh, uh, actually, I shouldn't say longevity tests because longevity tests are mostly for uh, executing the, uh, it's mostly for stress tests. It's mostly for the runtime system rather than the query optimizer. Right, but sometimes, mean, for example. It's just long running yeah. tests. Yeah, long running tests. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Oh, right now, I think uh, we already in Spark. We already uh, we also have this uh, stem. Uh, sorry, plan stability test. 
so yeah. for TPC queries. So if you, um, for example, if you just changed a rule or um, added a new rule that um, and you know ends up with a different query plans and that that'll be detected. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've done something wrong, but at least you know um, some some important like plan of changes can be caught by these um, like plan um, statistics. <laughs> Sorry, um, yeah, can can be caught uh, can be ca caught by these plan changes. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, that is basically a mechanism for you to review uh, the impact of your new rules, and not necessarily uh, the changes are bad. Okay, so uh, next step is uh, physical planning. So uh, in Catalyst, uh, physical planning contains two phases. And the first phase, we translate optimized logical plans into executable physical plans using uh, so-called strategies. And strategies are, basic, uh, are, are basically uh, scalar partial functions that turns uh, logical plans to physical plans. Uh, in the second phase, we, we use a rule executor to make sure that the plan is ready for execution. And uh, uh, please remember that the rule executors are used for converting one plant tree to a different shape, but same type of plant tree. And in this case, we are uh, using rule executor to turn the physical plants into a different shape of the physical plants. And uh, these rule execu uh, this rule executor uh, is used to uh, prepare things like a scalar, a scalar uh, subquerist and ensure requirements on import rows like uh, sorting and partitioning those kinds of properties and also uh, apply a certain physical optimization like uh, removing uh, unnecessary uh, sorting um, operators. Uh, we, we will see uh, some examples later. So for planning, uh, for physical planning, uh, an optimized logical plan is translated into executable physical plan by applying a set of uh, strategies and uh, here is an example of the uh, strategy that converts. So you can see that uh, a, the, the input plan node is a type of a logical plan and the return type is a sequence of a Spark plan. So this, from this function signature, you can see that um, uh, initially Catalyst was designed in the, uh, with a mind that um, a, the query planner should be able to generate a series of uh, physical plans and then we try to search the, uh, the plant space and find the optimal one. But uh, actually right now, today, as we explained, uh, we only generate one physical plant at the moment. So here, these, uh, here are two very simple, or uh, actually the simplest um, plant nodes inside uh, Catalyst, which is a project and filter. So there is no tricky things. So it's just a, a logical project node to a physical project. Execute uh, I think there's a certain noise. It doesn't. Okay, and uh, this uh, plan later uh, function is basically a trigger for other strategies. So we can we can uh, ignore it here. So it basically uh, tells the callus that to plan this uh, child uh, physical. Uh, this child logical plan tree is using um, appropriate other uh, strategies later. And here is an example of uh, what we mean by ensuring uh, requirements. So let's let's check in this uh, sort merge join. So because for sort merge joins, there is a, a natural requirement uh, that um, both sides of this join should be sorted by the corresponding columns. And in this case, the uh, sort condition of t1.id equals t2.id. So for t1, uh, rows should be sorted by t1.id, and for t2, rows should be sorted by t2.id. And uh, in order to, uh, to meet this requirements, uh, we insert two sort operators here. And you can see that um, uh, this is a physical to physical uh, plan tree transformation. And also, uh, physical, a physical plan op uh, optimization uh, can jump in here. So what if, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so uh, what if uh, this the T1 is already um, sorted by a T1.id? And in this case, we can actually uh, remove a redundant sort using a physical optimization rule. 
And in this case, um, if T1 is already sorted, then this sort is no longer needed. Then we can safely remove it. So in a nutshell, ValueSpark emerged as a unified analytics of data processing engine. And it later developed a relational structure later, Spark SQL. And uh, we consolidated the rest of the ecosystem upon it so that all kinds of workloads can benefit from a unified optimizer and the runtime. And with the help of the Catalyst optimizer and the data source API, Spark SQL, again, it allows users to work with data in any format to store, store it anywhere at scale. Um, however, while being powerful, this approach actually uh, imposes a certain unique challenges. And first of them is that uh, many data sources cannot provide a sufficient or accurate statistics to facilitate the curve line. For example, uh, the, uh, the use case I mentioned previously, that at JRIC, so we, we even the right data sources for Jira, for Jenkins, and for PagerDuty. And it is actually basically impossible uh, to um, extract accurate statistics from these data sources. And secondly, the storage layer is out of the Spark's control. So previously collected statistics can easily go out of sync because you don't know who uh, can just override a certain part of the data set uh, offline or uh, it's, it's basically out of your control. So these imply that maintaining an efficient cost model is more challenging and may lead to suboptimal runtime performance. So the solution that we are uh, trying uh, at Databricks uh, can, uh, there, there are basically uh, two approaches we're trying. The first one is Delta Lake, which is an open source uh, storage layer that brings the asset transaction to Apache Spark and big data workloads. So uh, it contains a scalable and self-managed table metadata so that um, uh, all the statistics and are uh, automatically collected and stored uh, in a self-managed manner so that um, the better optimization opportunities can be leveraged. So if you want to learn more details, uh, you can check delta.io. But this is not the uh, topic we're going to further discuss today. And the second one, which uh, Marin will introduce soon, is adaptive query execution. So this is uh, for re-optimizing and adjusting core plans on the fly based on runtime statistics, which is always accurate. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so, so we, we collect that these are uh, always accurate statistics, uh, statistics uh, in the middle of the uh, query execution and then re-optimize and adjust query plans. So this is a new feature available in Spark 3. And uh, yeah, so next I'll hand it over to Marianne for the perfect. adaptive query execution. Because like, I had a bunch of questions about what you were doing, so if Marianne's going to talk about that, this is perfect. Okay, cool. Go for it. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, so thanks, Lian Chen, for uh, you know going over the um, uh, callous part. Um, so the last thing he mentioned uh, just now was that the uh, the challenges that we were presented with uh, doing cost based optimization, um, especially you know in terms of uh, the up to dateness and completeness of uh, um, the the statistics. Um, so to address this issue, um, um, we're um, like we've been doing something like adapt query execution, and you know this term has been around in the database world for for a while now. Um, but in Spark specifically, um, that means you know we do re-optimization uh, in in the middle of query execution, and is powered by uh, runtime statistics. And then, um, um, and then, um, so one of the challenges was, of course, you know, like stale and missing statistics that could lead to uh, inaccurate estimates. And then stats collection can also be expensive, especially if you want to collect some more advanced stats like column histograms, which can give you like more accurate estimate, but on the other hand, is more costly to collect. And sometimes, you know, customers decide it's probably not worth it, you know, um, for, the, for the benefit it might just bring you. Um, and then there are certain places where, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, an estimate is not even possible. 
Uh, for example, user-defined functions, and it's just a completely a black box. Um, there's no way to look into it and get, you know, selectivity estimate. Uh, and then some people would argue that, you know, um, hints would work for, from, for, for some queries. One big problem with hints is not automatic at all. So it involves a lot of manual tuning and also um, it probably won't work well for um, like data set that changes a lot over time. Um, so for example, like if you think your data set is is small enough to do a broadcast drawing, but you know one day it's not that case, and you get um, you know out of memory errors, stuff like that. Um, so to address this issue, um, and AQE is looking at you know like collecting runtime stats and uh, doing reoptimizations uh, on top of the existing query plan. Uh, based on the runtime stats. So we'll still do the static planning optimization as we do before, but we'll just adjust the plan on the fly uh, when we get more, um, you know, runtime stats. Um, and then today, before we go into, um, like, the implementation details, there's one important idea in Spark. Um, I, I like to go over here. Um, so that we understand how, um, you know, when, how um, adaptive execution, query execution is applied. Um, so this, um, so we have, I mean, like, like Spark, you know, is a distributed computation system or Spark SQL, we could, we could look at it as a um, distributed database. So we try to parallelize uh, computation as much as possible but at some point we have to kind of move data around throughout the whole cluster um, so these operations here we call them exchanges so it's either a shuffle uh, which means you know the data is moved from from one node like to the red I mean from one node to all of the nodes in the cluster um, I mean like from like it's just, you know, it goes all over the place. Or broadcast is like, you know, the whole data set, it goes to each of the nodes in the cluster. Um, anyway, so, um, so at such points, you know, um, like the core stages, we call them, we call them like each, um, like, so, sorry. So like each of these um, exchange points are actually, the dividing point for um, something we call query stages. So at in, inside each query stage, everything is executed in parallel on, on, on all of the nodes. And then at the, at the boundary of each query stage, data is moved around throughout the whole cluster. And then, um, you know, after this, uh, shuffle process or ex, you know broadcast exchange process another stage starts where the the, the computation is um, conducted in parallel again right um, and then so these um, like the the boundary of those um, you know query stages are actually optimal for applying um, adaptive execution because um, you know, it's like, first of all, it's a break point for operator pipelines. So there is no way you can, uh, pipeline the operations, um, I mean, across different core stages, right? And then, uh, the other thing is at each of these points, uh, actually this is the best, um, like this is the, the best time where you can get. Uh, accurate runtime statistics because in Spark, the way we implement these exchanges is we kind of materialize, we kind of write, write the uh, intermediate result in, onto disks um, at the end of each query stage to, do, to be able to do shuffle broadcast exchange. So when you write, write down the data, you get the exact size of your, your you know, intermediate data set. 
And then this is a process of um, like the, the overall workflow of how this work uh, together with the, you know, the idea of uh, shuffle stages. So first of all, you start all the leaf stages, which means, you know, the stages that don't depend on the executional result of other stages. Uh, you kick off the, the leaf stages, uh, and then whenever a stage, you know, completes and comes back, you have more stats. And this is when you can uh, just go over the plan, um, look, you know, apply some optimizations and see if, you know, your current plan has to be adjusted um, since you have new stats coming in, right? And after that, uh, it also means another thing that, you know, one stage or a couple of stages has finished. It also means that stages that are dependent on the finished stages are probably now ready to be um, started. So you could also look at there if there's any other stages uh, that have their dependency cleared and then can be you know, kicked off um, right now. And then you just start those dependent stages and then um, you repeat this process, you know, like wait for another stage to complete, wait for new stats to come in and then re-optimize and then start you know, the rest of the stages as you go. And then in the very end, you know, you just come to the top of your plan and the whole process is, is, is done. Uh, do we have any questions up to this point? So it sounds like you're doing the old Gertz graphy, uh, the parametric optimization one, right? There's no switch operator. You're not generating multiple plans at the same time. You're just going back to the, to the optimizer and generating. Yeah, plan. exactly. So we're going back to the optimizer. We're you, we actually we're reusing the optimizer and the planner uh, and the physical planner to do this. So like one benefit we get from this is, um, I mean, like, I mean, the the decision will be um, and like unified, you know, whatever, um, based on the input. So um, it's, um, and also like, you know, we're not, uh, the fact is that we're not running the whole optimizer because it's costly, you know, like the Spark optimizer is, you know, with all the rules present, it's costly, but we are just running a subset of the optimizer rules that can um, be, you know, that that we, we can definitely uh, benefit from the run given the runtime stats, the type of runtime stats we can collect. So, for sure. example, if we are not collecting uh, cardinality stats, we are not going to run rerun the join reorder rule. Um, but you know, some other stuff that we can see, we 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 can see that can we can possibly um, benefit from. Uh, we'll just rerun those rules. So I have a quick question. So I'm wondering what kind of stats uh, you are going to collect. Does it have any relationship with uh, whatever stats already available before query execution, or you just collect some uh, new things uh, from the scratch? And, and, and are those stats independent of whatever? Uh, no, actually, um, well, actually, no. I mean, like, so the type of stats we have right now in Spark, it has, um, you know, for example, we have the row count, we have the byte count, uh, like data size, right? And then we have column stats, for example, like the NDVs, like a uh, number of distinct values of certain columns, stuff like that. Um, and then we have min max values for column. Um, uh, we even have, histogram like column histograms but I don't think it's being at actively used in spark at this moment um, but but for a that for execution right now only the very basic stats that are uh, data size and bytes and a number of rows row count is collected uh, for you know, for the reason that collecting column stats would be too costly. I see. I see. Thanks. Yeah, but I mean, like you can definitely. I mean, like it's not implemented, but in theory, you can definitely enable that if you want to enable. If your your specific case would benefit from join reorder at runtime, so you could just connect decide to collect some um, you know column stats uh, to be able to do that. Sure. Sure. Thanks. 
Um, so I'll just go ahead uh, with um, the three features uh, we have already implemented. Wait, I, 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 think, I, I think we have one more question. Elena, you have a question? Um, yeah, hi, I'm, El I'm Elena. So after a shuffle, I think the data distribution among different machines are quite different. Do you consider that into your optimization? Uh, here's the thing. This like <laughs> so data distribution you can't you can't really change that right now because you know it's it's required by the next stage right the 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 data dis distribution after a shuffle is whatever um that is required for the next stage you can't really change that um but we we could also collect things like you know per partition data size which can be helpful uh, for for some uh, uh, physical planning uh, decisions. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, thanks. All right. Um, uh, hi. hi. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, uh, I do have some questions here. So based on the three things you listed, uh, I can like imagine like some work um, data works has done for the two, for, for the first two. Maybe like after the previous stages, now the petition that we already have is compatible with something we're expecting, or maybe um, based on the new statistics, uh, we could apply some new joins instead of some more join that can well somehow speed up the execution. But for the third one, could you give an example? Like, how do we optimize skew joins based on um, actual statistics? Okay, so this is just a like a page, you know, like a, kind of like an mm -hmm. agenda for what we are going to talk about <laughs> next. So I'm, I'll, I'll just uh, <laughs> oh, okay. these items. I'll, I'll give. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just talk talk through how they work. Um, like I'll give uh, like simple examples of you know the um, you know yeah. It, it, you know, I think what, what, by the time we get to the end of my talk, you'll probably have a pretty good idea of uh, how school okay. on operation works. Yeah. All right. Um, well, go ahead then. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah. And then, um, so the three uh, major optimizations we have for uh, adaptive execution in Spark 3 are um, uh, dynamically coalesced shuffle partitions uh, means, you know, combined shuffle partitions, um, dynamically um, switch join strategies, uh, which is basically, you know, from shuffle, um, sh uh, sorry, sort merge join to, um, uh, to broadcast as join. And then the skew join optimization, which is like you have to detect the skew at runtime and uh, try to solve the skew problem for your join. And the first one is, um, so we just talked about shuffle. Um, and then uh, one important factor to shuffle performance is this, um, like the shuffle number. So what is the shuffle number? So on a mapper side, you have to decide like how many buckets you're going to shuffle your data into. Um, and, then, um, and then like for each bucket, like, and then for each bucket uh, in the next query stage, it will be a, a task, like a, uh, like a parallel task. So for example, um, if we say um, the default number is 200, and then if the, your shuffle number is 200, would, that means your, the number of tasks in your next query stage is going to be 200. And then for example, if you're dealing with uh, 10 gigabytes of data and you can roughly get this, you know, um, like, you know, like each of your tasks is going to be operating on like 10 gigabytes divided by 200, you know, um, that, I mean, then, and then as the, the size of data grows, if the shuffle number doesn't change, you would expect that each task is dealing with more and more, uh, like larger and larger data set, right? Um, so that's why it's crucial to query performance of, uh, you know, and then, so for example, like, you know, uh, we talk about, you know, like the, the data size is big while your shuffle number is small. Um, what happens is 
um, for example, like your next curl stage is going to do a sore. That's, that's the most common case we can see that, you know, and then, and then if each task is dealing with a large uh, piece of data, what you get is your sort operation is going to keep spilling to disks. And in some extreme circumstances, um, like your task would never finish. It would just keep on running. Um, and because of, you know, like it just keeps spilling and um, also like keeps doing um, like garbage collection. Um, and then the other side is, okay, so your data set is small and then your partition number is high. So like maybe each task is just dealing with a few kilobytes of data, which is not efficient either. Cause you have like, a, like you have a lot of, like a large number of tasks that your Spark scheduler has to deal with. It has to schedule over, you know, over the cluster, right? And also if the data set is small for each task, there's a lot of like inefficient IOs. Um, and then also like, you know, there's, there's also like tasks for each task. There's also like, you know, like some small overhead in the beginning to set up the task, um, you know, uh, the task environment for it to start. Right. And then um, with Spark right now, um, the, the shuffle is like once you decide a number, once your query starts, you decide this shuffle number, it just never changes throughout a whole query. And most likely your application will have the, a single um, you know, shuffle number um, for different queries. Um, and then like, like it's very common to see that within, like within each query, the data size expands or shrinks like in different stages. For example, if you're doing a join operation, your data size will be growing most likely. Um, and then if you're doing the aggregate, it's the other way around, you know, it just shrinks. Uh, and then it, having, a uni uh, having a universal partition number doesn't work in this case, right? Um, you don't want to set it too high. You don't want to set it too low. Um, no good either way. So uh, the solution here is it's not a perfect solution, uh, I have to say, but, um, but one thing we could do here is we start with a pretty high um, partition number. But in the, like, at the end of each stage, you can actually, after getting the overall data size for the next stage, right? Because the output of your current shuffle stage is the input of your next query stage. So at the end of this shuffle stage, you could get exact and the exact size of your data set and decide, okay, so what number, like what, what number of tasks is appropriate for the next stage? Um, and totally based on, you know, um, the data size. Um, and then once you get this number, um, or I mean, it's just a rough size of your tasks, uh, of your you know, parallel tasks. For example, um, it, the default setting is uh, like 64 megabytes. So you have this 64 megabytes and you try to pack like the, 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 the small partitions, like, you know, um, cause you're, you tend to be over partitioned in the beginning. Right. And then you pack the small partitions into a big group and put them in, in a single task to avoid, you know, your tasks dealing with two, like two small data set. Um, but, you know, it has to come with a, you know, like a sufficient uh, initial number first. Um, so that's why it's not uh, optimal. It's not like perfect solution, but uh, most likely it just, you know, like if, the customer, like if our customer is already doing over partitioning anyway, because the under partitioning, like the partition number being too small and each task being too large is more of a problem than the other way around. But, um, but if they're already doing over partitioning for performance um, reasons, and this coalesce partition is going to improve the per performance furthermore, because it's deal with um, like the, the stages where data shrinks 
and we can pick an optimal number for, uh, for, for the number of tasks. Uh, do we have more questions here? How, how many more slides do you have? Sorry. We're, like, we're uh, so we're running out of time, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me go over this uh, quickly. Um, let's just skip this one and then let's see the, the next um, optimization in APUE. And um, so this is, uh, and then the next one is uh, dynamic join strategy. And uh, this is like going, um, so it, again, it's just the, um, whatever, uh, the wrong estimate you could have at, at um, static planning time. So most likely, I mean, if your um, estimate goes, um, like most likely it's over, because uh, we try to be very conservative when we do estimate. So a lot of the joins will be planned as Sotmer join, which is less efficient than broadcast test join. So AQE, when it sees, you know, uh, one side is small enough to actually be broadcast, it will, it will change the plan to do a broadcast hash join at runtime. And I'll just go, like skip these slides and because someone is like very interested in um, how SKU join works. Um, so, and the magic part of, you know, it's, I think it's the kind of the, the magic part of AQE here is, is SKU join. Um, so, and, I, and as, I, as I said, we can actually get the per partition size uh, at the end of each shuffle. So you will see that, um, like if you, you can easily detect that, uh, you know, one of the partitions or, or just a few of the partitions are going to be super large. So like if without skew drawing optimization, you, you probably end up with a situation where some tasks are dealing with a large, amount of data while the the rest of the tasks are just you know they they just end like so quickly and what is worse is that uh the skew partitions um they actually i mean they actually cause other serious problems as uh this spilling so when like sort merge join has a sort operation so it just like keeps spilling to disks and also like um like if if you are joining two big partitions, like if it happens, you know, in a way that a partition, like a single partition is skew on both sides, it's even worse. When you do join, it explodes in that for that specific task. So, and then it's easy for AQE to detect such like extremely large partitions. And, and, and then the solution is actually, in that case, we split the partition, like we split the large partition into several sub partitions. So here we can see that, um, you know, like partition A0, like on key A0, is larger, significantly larger than the rest of other partitions from table A. And then after we detect that, uh, we split into this big partition into small splits, like three splits, and each split has to join the entire, um, like in the entire, um, you know, um, partition from the other side. And if if it, I mean, like this, I mean, it, it doesn't show here in this slide, um, but just to go a little further, uh, what happens if the other side is also skewed on this partition key? So what happens is you know like we we eventually will end up with a Cartesian product with all the splits so if this side we for example if this side has we also split it into three sub partitions and this side has three sub partitions and we'll end up with a you know like nine tasks like three by three uh to deal with skew join um, and um, so in a lot of cases that we've seen with our like benchmark and customer cases, uh, it's this, you know, this is working like very uh, effectively. Uh, and then the last page is about um, like TPC um, benchmark. And we got like 30, 32 queries that has more than 1.1, like 10% speed up. And then, um, 
And then query 77 has over like eight times speed up. Um, and then that this only includes the effect of the first two optimizations in adaptive execution because, you know, uh, like TPC benchmark doesn't really generate um, data skew. Yeah. And that's the end of my uh, part today. Okay, awesome. We're, we're a little over time. Okay. Does anybody have one quick question? Mingjia, do you have a question? Um, oh. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the explanation. Yeah, it's of my question. So uh, for the, the third optimization, well, to, uh, I wonder, well, to get this applied in Spark 3.0, do we have to simply like, enable the config or the like, do we have to um, preview some statistics on tables that queries are running on? Uh, sorry, I can't hear you very quickly, uh, very clearly. Because oh, sorry. Okay. Your voice uh, is just asking. Sorry, sorry about it. Can you, can you type your oh, question? Well, I think I got the question. Uh, basically, uh, do we need to pre uh, to pre collect all the statistics in order to use AQE? No, we don't. Um, I mean, I I think it works. Um, I mean, if you're, uh, I I mean, like, here's the thing. Um, so we we did a benchmark on both. Um, like, you know, uh, like based, uh, like the baseline, uh, is either, um, like, pr you know, a data set with pre-collected stats and another experiment is on data set that has no stats at all. And you can see that, you know, it's, it's more effective on the, on, on the latter one because, you know, like the baseline is lower, but you should expect it to work pretty well without um, pre-collected stats. All right, Siptik, one quick question. Is, is it quick? Yeah, it's a small question. Uh, so uh, I was just wondering, like, uh, I, I read some talks in which by relational IQ and stuff, where they were using something called worst case optimal join algorithms to in, in order to optimize like this skewed join query. So I was just wondering, I, I, so I don't have much idea about these, but I just want uh, uh, so, uh, so j I, I, I just wanted to ask if you guys uh, uh, worked on these or if you had any idea about these. Uh, I, I, I don't know of the thing you were talking about, but for skew join, I think for, I mean, it's, it's just best suited with AQE because you don't have, um, like we, our Databricks, uh, like in, in Databricks, we had this, um, you know, um, like our proprietary feature with a static skew join optimization. Um, but basically you have to know like a lot of information. You have to kind of know which table and which columns are most likely to have skew. Um, but this is so natural to do in adaptive execution because, you know, you just at the end of each shuffle, you just get the data size of each partition and you know exactly how skew it is and how, you know, which partition are have, have the skew um, and, you know, like how many spits you have to, you have to break it into. Yeah, so I, I can answer this question. For the worst case operable joins, I think the only systems that I know that supports this was uh, Logic Blocks and uh, Relational AI, the new guys, which is the ex Logic Blocks guys. And then I think the Germans have it either in 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 in, in Hyper, but I, I don't know whether it. No, sorry, take it back. I think it was it was in Umbra, the new one they put it in there. Okay, I have to go get my baby. Uh, I appreciate you guys do, being here and doing this. This is awesome.